great range of mountains crossing the Arctic Circle, with valleys a mile wide and a mile deep. Glacial tongues of ancient ice reaching down across the mountains into deep saltwater fjords. Come with us now as we explore a land the Eskimos know as Auyuwitook, land of the big ice. surprised by this Arctic landscape, for this part of Baffin Island includes some of the most unexpected and striking scenery in Canada. The size and scale of the land overwhelms you. A wild blend of rock and glacial ice reaching down into deep saltwater fjords thrusting upwards to 7,000-foot mountains and divided by broad river valleys that wind gently through the tundra. For wilderness photographers like John and Janet Foster, this is wide-angle country. You might start a trip into the new national park as they did, with a map and some guidance from the park planner who covered more than 50,000 miles in the Arctic by helicopter, searching for this perfect area. This is the first uh, truly Arctic park in the world. It's about 1,500 miles from Montreal, lying on the Cumberland Peninsula of Baffin Island. And here we have the Arctic Circle, which cuts right across the park. I think maybe if we look at this map, we'll have a better idea of the park itself. Right in the center of the park is the Penny Ice Cap, uh, an area of about 2,300 miles of ice, probably five to 6,000 feet deep. On this side of the park, we have the fjords. The cliffs along the fjords go to about five, 6,000 feet, and many of these are just vertical drop-offs. Um, I read that these are probably the highest vertical cliffs in the world. Bill Sheppens did not exaggerate. Some of the most impressive cliffs in the world are here at Cape Searle. This remote island towers 1,500 feet above the pack ice of Davis Strait and is the home of more than 100,000 seabirds. We landed as close as we could. Here we were about 75 miles north of the Arctic Circle. It was a remote and lonely place, and small comfort to know that Panyertung was a hundred miles to the south, and the nearest neighboring landmass far out to sea was Greenland. You can get here by freighter canoe from the nearby community on Broughton Island, but I think it would be a cold and windy trip. In these few short weeks of Arctic summer, the pack ice moves away from shore, revealing a rich marine life. These great mammals are walrus, weighing close to a ton, with magnificent ivory tusks. This region of the Eastern Arctic is not as inaccessible as you might think. Twice a week, and weather permitting, small aircraft from Frobisher Bay fly up this fjord into the hamlet of Pangerton, an Eskimo community about 1,500 miles north of Montreal. 
One of the first people we met was Ross Payton. Ross runs a little hotel here, affectionately known as the Payton Place Hotel. And he warns visitors who come here to the new park that the conditions out there in Pangertung Pass are difficult and dangerous, that they should be physically fit, they should be prepared to carry very heavy packs, it could be cold and extremely windy, and they'll be out of touch most of the time they're in there. He also chuckles a little when he remembers the group that came up here wearing only running shoes. It's 18 miles from here to the park boundary at the end of the fjord. You can hire a freighter canoe and leave from here at high tide, and then arrange to be picked up a couple of days later. It takes about an hour to get to the end of the fjord. This was now July, and you're still advised to bundle up warmly. It's always cold on the water. You should remember that all the gear you will need is going to go in on your back, and that would include a small stove and some fuel because this is the Arctic, and there are no trees in the Arctic, and no firewood. But I think a glimpse of Pangertung Pass is worth all of these hazards and discomforts. Pangertung Pass, where the mountains reach into the sky more than a mile above you, and the valley floor is a mile across. Up here, 2,000 feet above the valley, immense glaciers reach down between the mountains, a reminder that this land is still emerging from the last great ice age. The mountains here are 600 million years old and carry the scars of four great ice ages that left them steep and jagged and littered with loose rock. At one time, Pangyutung Pass itself was filled by a glacier. thousand feet, Pangyutung Pass is revealed as one of the wildest and most beautiful valleys on earth. As you look down from here, you realize that Pangyutung Pass will someday be one of the greatest hiking trails in the world. It may also be one of the most dangerous. It's very rough, it's littered with boulders and debris, there's the constant threat of landslides, and there are icy streams to wade across, and winds that come down off the penny ice cap at 120 miles an hour. Most of the visitors who come to the park are going to head straight for this valley. It's 60 miles long, a mile deep, and up to two miles wide. There are hanging glaciers all through the pass, and saltwater fjords at either end. This is not a land for inexperienced travelers. And yet there are ways to see the country. You might arrange to charter a local freighter canoe and travel south from Pangyutung into the ice flows of Cumberland Sound. The sea has long been a highway in the Arctic frozen hard for dog sleds and snow machines in the winter, open for boats or kayaks in the summer. We were traveling with Peter Slaterman, an archeologist. Peter was born in Copenhagen and educated in Alaska, in Newfoundland and Alberta. He was here exploring the coastline for ancient Eskimo settlements from the old Thule culture. Simeoni Kinainik is a young Inuit who's traveled across Canada, and he's very involved and very interested in his people and his community.
We learned a lot about travel across sea ice from Simeone, including how to cross an ice floe with four men and a heavy canoe. Or perhaps I should say three men, one lady, and a heavy canoe. basic ground rule here, you never let go of the boat. And that's the way it's done when you're crossing an Arctic sea. Journeys end on a cold, rocky shore late at night. A few yards inland are the skulls and skeletons of Thule Inuit hunters who lived and died here hundreds of years ago. More than a thousand years ago, a new wave of Eskimo culture spread across North America. In the harsh beauty of this secluded bay at King Nate Fjord, some of those Thule people lived and hunted and died. This Thule culture was based largely on the hunting of creatures of the sea, particularly whales. This was a fox trap hundreds of years old. It was simply a hollow dome of rocks. The bait would be left inside, the fox would come along and jump in after it, and then of course he'd be unable to jump out again. There was an old skull in the trap, too big for a fox, but probably from some long-deceased camp dog. This was an old Thule winter house excavated by Peter. This was the entrance tunnel, and it's a tight squeeze getting in. The roof has been long gone, but it would have been made from the bones of whales, from caribou skins and sod. But the house area seems awfully small, and yet it was home for a large family. The floor is stone. The seats were set against the walls. And there was space for cupboards. Peter had found some artifacts. They might have been buried here for anywhere up to 800 years. This was a scraper. It was made out of caribou bone. And a beautifully carved brooch. And incidentally, before Peter became interested in human history, he worked in a New York advertising agency. Who was he, Peter? Uh, who might he have been? Well, uh, we haven't determined whether it's uh, male or female at this point. The burial itself is a Thule Eskimo grave, Cairn grave. And uh, as far as we can see from here, there is only one person buried in the, in the grave. Quite likely there's uh, a bit of sand and it's possible that you may have additional skeletons down underneath. How many people are buried around here, do you know? This is a very large uh, burial area and we've counted 85 to maybe even 90, 90 graves. There could be more. Was there anything buried along with them, Peter? Would there be anything anything put into the into the coffin of, this is what we can call yeah. it? Yeah, the, uh, if it was a hunter, for instance, the uh, hunting gear would be placed either inside the grave itself with the, the, with the body or else in a small cairn uh, adjacent to the, to the grave itself. Would the Eskimos have simply wandered away, Peter, when they felt it was time to die, or would they have been sent away? No, this has changed again uh, through time and also depending on the place. In Greenland, there's a tradition of the older people walking up into the mountains without food 
just to die. Uh, here, the the person who was ill and let's say the uh, shaman, the medicine man, decided that there was no cure. The person would be taken out and put in a small house or a snow igloo and uh, left to die. There was a great dread of having a person die within the winter house because that meant that everybody had to move out of the house and the house had to be sealed up and nobody could move back into it again. Why? Because of the because of spirits or the spirit, was it legend? The spirit of the deceased would, would linger in the house. About 40 species of birds live on this part of Baffin Island. High up on vertical cliffs, overlooking fjords and inlets, small colonies of glaucous gulls raise their young and ride the wind. The gulls also object to visitors but the glaucous skull is really the prettiest of all. It's almost completely white and one of the largest in North America. Another and more hopeful pair of eyes was also gazing up at these plump birds running back and forth under the cliff, wistfully contemplating 200 feet of sheer rock. The fox was more curious and frightened, and possibly we were the first two-legged animals he'd ever seen. We soon found ourselves playing a kind of a game of hide-and-seek with him among the rocks. Only he was far better at the game than we were. He was winning. It's catching. Two sounds are fairly constant up here. The rumble of falling rock and fresh water cascading down from little lakes and streams. These tumbling streams and cascades rise and fall with the temperature, responding to warm weather with a flood of melting snow and drying up almost overnight when the temperature drops. There was a little lake at the top of the hill overlooking the sea with a pair of red-throated loons and two young. These loons liked the small freshwater lakes in the tundra and the adults were fishing out in the salt water of Cumberland Sound. Stormy weather struck King Nate Fjord the next day, and as the tide went out, the cold beauty of sculptures from the sea was revealed in the gray morning light.
To a photographer, there is always beauty and texture in the Arctic landscape, regardless of the weather. In fact, some of your best photographs are taken on black, stormy days. Later this day, they left King Nate Fjord and traveled back to Pangatung for supplies before setting out deep into the interior of this immense national park. Of all the little communities that cling to Arctic shorelines across Canada, the hamlet of Pangatung is surely one of the most active and colorful. About 800 people live here, between the mountains and the sea, just a few miles south of the Arctic Circle. Surprisingly, Pangatung is still largely a hunting community, although these seal skins, hung up to dry with a washing, are often all that's taken these days from a creature that once supplied oil, meat, and clothing. And where else can you find sculpted works of art drifting in from the sea? Everyone who comes to the new national park will spend some time here, and maybe a lot of time if the weather is bad. But you'll have a kind of total Arctic experience, living in an Eskimo village and hiking over an Arctic landscape. The word Eskimo is actually an Indian word, meaning eater of raw meat. Today, Eskimos would rather be known as Inuit, meaning the people. The long darkness and violent storms of winter are forgotten. Pang your tongue in July can be sunlight and children's laughter at two o'clock in the morning as entire families fish from the rocks at low tide. For this is also the land of the Arctic char, a delicately flavored salmon coming in from the sea to spawn. A time of celebration and joy, all too brief and tempered by the knowledge that even now in mid-July, the days are becoming noticeably shorter. Pangnertung is the only community in the Canadian Arctic that has three craft industries, weaving, carving, and printmaking. The tapestries that these girls are weaving are adapted from local designs. They're using brilliant colors, and when the tapestries are finished, they're worth hundreds of dollars in the South. Many, in fact, have been bought by the National Art Gallery in Ottawa. They also make scarves and tablecloths, and it's all very slow and very painstaking work. Designs for prints are taken from local legends and superstitions. They reflect the customs and history of the Inuit people. What impressed us was that these were young men who were quietly producing fine works of art. And obviously, a cultural heritage is surviving at Pangnertung. We found that some of the most powerful works are the whalebone carvings. This man is Kakasilalek, 
He has been to the Soviet Union and Western Europe with his carvings. The whalebone comes from the skeletons of whales that were killed by 19th century whalers out in Cumberland Sound. And this carving we couldn't resist and we bought. one real kayak here. In fact, it's the only one in Panyertung. And we asked Marcusi Pichula if he'd paddle it for us. His name means sea pigeon, and he spent most of his life 60 miles away in camp. And he's paddled a kayak during all seasons of the year. He's now in his 80s and was delighted to show us that the old skills are never lost. And consider this for a contrast. That white dish in the background relays phone calls to Canada's communications satellite, ANIC, far above the equator. Late in July, an ice floe drifted slowly down Pangertung Fjord, carrying a strange assortment of people. Dr. Joe McInnes, in the red suit, a well-known Canadian diver, and Andy Pruna, in the blue suit a photographer with the National Geographic Society in Washington. The prospect of someone actually swimming in water that can kill you in five minutes drew a small crowd from the settlement. Nandi Pruna is also an accomplished diver. In fact, he has dived with Cousteau. He is here now to photograph and to record their expedition. They discovered a rich world down there. They said there was more life and more vegetation than on the Arctic landscape above. In fact, they said it was almost a jungle in places and hard to penetrate. All of this rich growth in the Arctic comes from the upwelling of nutrients produced by the currents. Forty feet below the surface, emerald patterns of light glow softly through 28 degree water. A dangerously beautiful world with sharp ridges of ice almost invisible and dark canyons inviting the diver to explore and forget that the iceberg could move or tip at any time. They showed a keen interest in any kind of complicated equipment. The Arctic is full of tales about the mechanical skills and their ability to fix machinery they've never even seen before. And no photographer could resist the superb underwater equipment that Andy Pruna was using. <laughs> Andy is also an accomplished artist, sculptor and filmmaker. One of the reasons Joe was here was to test his theory that young Inuit men would make natural Arctic divers because of their experience with cold and their attitude towards cold and their mechanical ability. So he took every chance to demonstrate diving techniques, although possibly barehanded fishing was not really on his program. Do 
Does this dock keep you really warm or just pleasantly cool? Well, many times I'll come out of the water after uh, after an hour or so, even two hours, and be warmer than the people who've been standing around on the ice and, and in the wind. So, so it does really keep you warm. It's extraordinary underwear. It's uh, a pile material, much like the, the fur of an animal, although it's synthetic. And I wear this next to the skin and uh, this wool underwear on top. So I've got a lot of layers of, of air. And on top of that, the, uh, the suit. How cold is the water, Joe? It's uh, about 28 degrees. Um, doesn't change very much. May warm up to, say, 33, 34 perhaps. But there's a lot of ice. Uh, in the waters that we've been diving in, so I'm sure it's down around 30 anyway. Okay, a very practical question. How long would a person survive if they fell in without all these woolies and diving suits? And well, I guess that uh, you've got about five minutes of survival time. Some people, you know, would stop breathing right away because of the intense cold and, and uh, their bodies just couldn't tolerate it. I think on the average you might have just a couple of minutes to do something effective and not much more. This is the breathing regulator that we use and uh, I've tested a great number of them uh, in five years of coming up here to the Arctic and this one seems to work very well for us. It goes on the tank like this. On this your life depends I guess. This you? is the passport into the ocean right. and in some of our winter dives these regulators have uh, stopped working for us so we have oh. to be very careful <laughs> and stay very close to the, uh, to the breathing hole or to the hole through the ice. Here, try that. This is it, eh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It breathes very easily. Uh, our concern here in the Arctic is that sometimes this uh, can freeze up and it can stop in mid-breath. So Joe McInnes has traveled six okay, times to the high under, Arctic. Uh, He's a medical doctor specializing in underwater medicine and exploring the limitations of the human body under the stress of diving. And while he was hoping to introduce scuba diving to the young men of Pangatung, he also hoped to film the bowhead whale in its own environment. I think if you really wanted to keep warm, what you do is, is you put him inside your diving suit. <laughs> Hikers who have the legs for this kind of country may find themselves wondering about a land that can be so harsh and violent on one day and so gentle and beautiful the next. Here in Owl Valley, north of Pangyatung, John and Janet Foster experienced the other face of the Arctic, gentle tundra lowlands. A valley surrounded by great walls of rock rising almost vertically to 3,000 feet. Owl Valley is part of Pangnertung Pass, but to reach here you'd have to hike about 40 miles through the pass. And it's full of surprises like bumblebees and butterflies 50 miles above the Arctic Circle. We spent four days camped in Owl Valley. In an Arctic land that is dominated by the harshness of rock and ice, we found much of the color and life of Owl Valley in the tundra. There are some songbirds here, like the Lapland longspur. Lemmings are pretty little animals, and they're a basic part of the Arctic food chain. They live here on tundra vegetation, and in turn they get eaten by foxes and owls. But in this way, the energy flows from tiny plants of the tundra to the larger creatures. The population of foxes and owls will rise and fall with the sudden fluctuation in numbers of the lemmings, 
And of course, everyone knows that the lemming population will crash regularly and dramatically. The Arctic has been described as a cold desert. For up here in a dry, cold climate, everything decays much more slowly. These antlers could be a hundred years old. We found them everywhere. Some were lying on top like this, yet others were deeply embedded in the tundra. A superb, silent, daylight hunter. And one of the hunted, a young Arctic hare. Surviving sudden death from the sky by living close to giant boulders. He really had no fear. We went back three times to see him and always found him in exactly the same place. And just when he thought he'd finally shaken us off, there was that bothersome camera again. July 30th, four o'clock in the morning. A night that was filled with wind and driving rain has given way to a perfect dawn. The temperature, about 40 degrees. The snowy owl is one of the Arctic's most beautiful creatures. It's well adapted to extreme cold. His luxurious feathers go right down to the tips of his toes. And those big yellow eyes are quite unforgettable. If you look closely, you can see mosquitoes bothering the owls. The mosquitoes up here are large, black, and rather active when the temperature reaches 50 degrees, the kind of weather that produces tourists. This one is on my sweater, trying to find breakfast somewhere below. been falling and the temperature has gone down to 30 degrees. The wind is rising and there are signs of snow. When the winds start rising out here you tie your tent down to everything in sight. We've had a special cover designed for our tent. It's made of ripstop nylon. It weighs less than two pounds and extends down over the doorway as protection against driving rain or snow. You can sit out a pretty good storm under there, although I don't think I'd care to test it in Pangertung Pass when the winds reach 120 miles an hour. Janet's diary, July 31st. The wind howled all night, and we woke to the sound of wet snow hitting the tent. Up and out at seven o'clock to a white world
some freeze dry food tastes rather like warmed up sawdust, but then some is pretty good, like the mushroom omelet. You just add water and mix it up. You cook it like an ordinary omelet, and if you're cold and hungry enough, it's really quite tasty. The soft beauty of Owl Valley after a summer snowstorm was a sharp contrast to hard reality in the mountains, thousands of feet above. For three weeks, a group of Canadian and American climbers have been tackling the peaks surrounding this glacier. George Van Cochran, a surgeon from New York, and somewhere under all that gear, his wife, Bobby. followed by a musician, another surgeon, a psychologist, and a scientist from Montreal, Rick Kohlberg, a friend of John and Janet. They were here because they loved the isolation and wanted to climb in an area where no one had climbed before. This mountain was almost exactly on the Arctic Circle. They were well equipped for their three-week expedition. They had two orthopedic surgeons along. also wear hard hats. If you thought the Arctic was flat, consider this. There are 700 miles of mountains on Baffin Island, and most have never been climbed. Six thousand feet above sea level, a vast white dome fills the valleys and rolls across mountain ridges. The incredible Penny Ice Cap. Here, the ice beneath you could be a mile thick, covering a landscape that no man has ever seen. The entire ice cap is now within the new national park. It's actually a remnant of the last Wisconsin ice age, when much of North America was covered by ice. Bill Sheffin says that there's some evidence the Penny ice cap is growing and advancing again. This has led one researcher to estimate that it could reach New York City in 16,000 years. Let your imagination play for a moment here and you could be standing on the past, back in time, back in the last ice age. This was one of the most spectacular places we'd ever seen, the edge of the Penny Ice Cap where it slopes down to ground level. A wall of ice 200 feet high with a raging stream of meltwater below. And when chunks fall off of the face, they melt into beautiful designs. Move with care and respect into these valleys and your trip will be enriched by the purest form of wilderness experience. But travel carelessly with poor equipment and no understanding of the harsh potential of Arctic climates and you'll feel the bite of an unforgiving land. Yet amazingly, you can reach the very edge of this park in one day flying from Montreal.
out across the salt waters of Cumberland Sound now. And those white objects in the water are not ice flows. They're beluga whales swimming into shallow water to give birth to their calves. 700 of these graceful creatures appear here every summer. Northwest of Cumberland Sound, along the western limit of the National Park, open rolling tundra, feeding range of the barren ground caribou. Just a few miles from Pangerton now, with more than 8,000 square miles of national park below. An arctic wilderness without roads or any sign of man. Music from another time and another land. Music brought here by the Scottish whaling boats back in the 19th century. was always a beautiful land for them. It's harsh, cruel, and cold, yet they have found beauty, life, and texture where no other people could have survived. How many years has this been the unknown country, where the midnight sun brushes soft color into the tundra, and the falcons glide unseen among these ancient mountains? Now, a magnificent piece of this wild country is within reach, the first truly Arctic national park in the world. And it's just the beginning. Soon we'll look even farther north, Far above this land, the Inuit people have called Auyuitut, land of the big ice. Mm -hmm. 